With great sadness, I share the news that our irreplaceable friend and colleague, Gary Coletti, passed away on November 5th. He will be deeply missed by everyone at the Bill of Rights Institute, especially here at the Fabric of History, which he developed and put so much of himself into. We will always be inspired by his infectious quest for knowledge and unique ability to bring people together. We'll be putting out more content soon in celebration of his life and many achievements. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Fabric of History. I'm your host, Mary Patterson, and I'm so happy to have you back with us again. As always here on The Fabric of History, we're interested in diving into a dramatic story as a way to explore history and civics. The story of the first Thanksgiving is well known, but we thought we'd offer up the story with a BRI twist by focusing not so much on the holiday, but on the people, the pilgrims. Who were the pilgrims really? What is their story beyond Thanksgiving? And why do they have such a special place in American memory? To help me out with these questions, I brought in some special reinforcements, both of which you have heard on this podcast before. Kirk Higgins is the Director of Content here at the Bill of Rights Institute. Kirk oversees all the brilliance that goes on in our content team, and he also makes a really mean pie, so he's especially qualified for an episode about Pilgrims and Thanksgiving. Kirk, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you, Mary. I feel like now I need to go back and perfect my pie recipe even more. And bring it into the office. Absolutely. <laughs> and secondly, I'm delighted to be joined once again by Tony Williams, BRI's senior fellow. You can find Tony on BRI's Scholar Talk series on YouTube, where he sits down with experts in a whole host of topics. But in addition to this, Tony is a scholar and author in his own right, and he's also my personal fact checker. We chatted about his book, The Pox and the Covenant, on a previous episode of The Fabric of History, and we learned so much from him that we brought brought him back again. Tony, thank you for joining us today. Mary, uh, it's my pleasure and good to uh, be on with you and Kirk. Yes, we're again, we're glad that you both are here. And I started us off by saying that we really like dramatic narratives here at the Bill of Rights Institute. And I think the story of the pilgrims is fascinating. And it almost seems like a disservice to me to just limit them to their association with Thanksgiving. So it's like we're leaving out the best part of the story. So maybe a good place to start would be who, what are we actually talking about when we say the pilgrims? Who were they? Well, the pilgrims are those groups of separatists or what we commonly call Puritans. They were members of the Church of England who uh, were, were quite dissatisfied with what they considered to be the excessively Catholic and, and ritualistic sort of uh, character of the Church of England, of the Anglican Church. And the separatists actually separated themselves from that church because they felt it was just too impure. It was just too ritualistic, too Catholic, and so they separate themselves. And the idea is that they're going to go elsewhere to establish what will later be called the city upon a hill, right? They're going to go and leave, physically separate themselves, and establish a pure church. And the hope is that England uh, would, uh, especially the Church of England, would reform and would establish that pure character, that pure church that they thought. And then perhaps one day when this occurred, uh, they could return to that church. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, they would uh, leave the church, but then also physically separate themselves as well. So the story of the pilgrims doesn't, or it doesn't start in Massachusetts bay it really starts with um it starts in england like you're saying so they're puritans they want to purify the church of england and it's just beyond fixing right so they're separating themselves away so it almost sounds like they were 
is extreme appropriate an appropriate way to describe them? Yeah, I think I think it's a good question to ask, right? That it's during a period when there's a lot of of theological changes and debates and things that are happening and and coming after the the Protestant Reformation, you're seeing a lot of new uh in in different views coming about and I think that they were a reflection of of a particular period in time when when this was at the heart of a lot of um a lot of theological and religious debates, but also um, a lot of debates uh, politically as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a debate over orthodoxy, right? There's a debate over the character of the church. And, you know, from, from the time of the Protestant Reformation right up through, you know, in the American colonies, the first great awakening and the American nation, the second great awakening, there is a a great growth of various Christian denominations, right? And they're sort of battling, if you will, for the for the soul of Christianity, what what they think their version, their correct version is. So I, I, I don't know it's a matter of, you know, extremism so much as they just think they're right, as as do the members of the, the Church of England. Uh, and there's that battle over this orthodoxy. And, uh, you know, they they think the Church of England is wrong, but certainly Anglicans think that they're wrong, and and they are severely persecuted uh, for their beliefs, as in, you know. And they are uh, these ministers are are thrown out of the Church of England. So uh, you know, it it's a set of very strong, strongly held beliefs on both sides. It's interesting you use the phrase of battling for your soul. So I think that's that's pretty high stakes <laughs> when you think about it. And I think that's an important um, thing to consider if we're thinking about um, the worldview of these people. So I, I will say that I recently read a book by Nathaniel Philbrook called The Mayflower, which is about sort of the experience of, of the pilgrims. And it was it was so interesting. I learned so much more than, you know, what I learned as a little kid about the first Thanksgiving. But um, I think, I know going back to my initial thoughts here, the story of the pilgrims is so fascinating. It is a story of such hardship and despair that it's, I left coming away from it thinking, oh my God, I would never, I would never uproot my life like the way that these people did and came to Massachusetts in the winter to start over again. But if you think about this was, this was your soul that you were, that it was at stake here. I think that helps, um, helps us empathize with what, why they decided to do what they did. Right. And, and, and they left England, right. And they, they'd gone over to Holland and then eventually made their way over to America. Right. In which they thought they were kind of, you know, aiming for Virginia, uh, and, and, you know, kept going a, a little bit north uh, up towards Massachusetts. But, you know, one reason why I, I love Mayflower as well, the, the book by Philbrick, is it is it really brings out just how harrowing this journey was. And it was several months long. And, uh, you know, this sort of errand into the wilderness, as it's called, uh, it was an extraordinary voyage, very dangerous. Uh, and, their lives, uh, you know, were, were endangered and, and threatened. There, there was a great deal of peril in, in, in taking on this journey. Uh, so uh, th there's no small amount of courage in doing this as well. Yeah. And I, just to add to that, I think it's really important to emphasize how seriously they held those views. And I think when we're thinking about their experience and particularly thinking about Thanksgiving in sort of a historical context, it's important to keep that in mind that these weren't people that were just mouthing sort of words or trying to to do something that was uh, symbolic of this faithfulness, but they were truly people dedicated to this idea, dedicated to this pure version of what they saw as, um, as a direction that the, the church needed to go, this pure version of Christianity, and that that, that salvation was ultimately a a serious goal towards which they were working. And I think thinking about that in the context of Thanksgiving is, is important because it was, it was truly something that they saw as a, as a benevolent moment, right. As a moment where they were being truly thankful to, to God for what had been provided to them and for suffering and, and, and the benefits that came through, I think some of that suffering that they saw that suffering as a path 
towards that salvation um, in, in getting to that moment of Thanksgiving was then something truly, I think, important for them. Well, Tony, you mentioned uh, this, the harrowing journey of, ac- and then actually, you know, thinking we're heading towards Virginia, but actually, you know, ending up in Cape Cod in November. So I think we, maybe we should take a quick break and then talk a little bit more about what that actually meant and why they ended up where they were um, to sort of set the scene for what will the following year be the quote unquote first Thanksgiving. We established that the pilgrims, they're they're separatists, they have very, you know, deeply held beliefs about their religion and why they are, they need to leave England, they go to Holland, why they have to leave Holland and come, come to the new world after a really difficult journey, right? And Tony said they end up sort of by accident (laughs) in Cape Cod in November, so this is not the best time to be arriving in New England in the winter months. And that first winter, I think, is something that, again, for a modern audience, is really hard for us to understand just how how difficult and terrifying it must have been for these men, women, and children that had just sur- survived like 66 days in a ship. And just, it sounds absolutely, it sounds horrible. So can you talk a little bit about what was that winter like for them or what happens when they actually get on land after their journey? Well, it's it's quite terrible, uh, as one can <laughs> imagine. I mean, they've been at sea uh, and they have their ship and, and they have some of their supplies, which, you know, were probably sort of worm ridden by then and, and not entirely uh, consumable. but you know, they, there's no crops, you know, here, they have to plant crops. And of course they're here in the middle of, uh, you know, as winter is beginning, uh, in Massachusetts, which is, uh, you know, a, a tough winter, uh, even today. And, you know, they just don't really have, you know, enough food. Uh, they're suffering from scurvy, which is a deficiency of vitamin C. Uh, and I, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but roughly half of them die. Uh, it's really tragic. And, you know, we often associate that sort of death pattern and disease with, with Jamestown. And that was very bad as well. But, you know, the, 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 the pilgrims uh, experience, you know, a, a really harsh winter and the colony barely survives. And, you know, you want to talk about drama. You know, we sort of usually leave that part out. But, uh, you know, the, the, the fate of the colony really in many ways, you know, uh, hung on the, the, the edge of a knife uh, in terms of surviving. Uh, and they do. Uh, and we can understand perhaps why they're so grateful and, and thankful come the first Thanksgiving. Well, I think at least the story that we get when we're little is that a big reason why they are able to survive through that first winter, not having great shelter, having hardly any food, is that they do get help from the local Native Americans. I think we as Americans like to play up that part of the story because I think it's important, this idea of of cooperation and helping each other to get through things is something that that still resonates with us. But um, why would Massasoit, so the local leader, why would he want to help these people coming into his land? Do we, I mean, do we know anything about that or what his motives may have been, or is it just speculative? Right, well, well, some of it is speculative, but you can imagine, I mean, many Native Americans were, were, uh, were, were very good traders and, and would want to, you know, they interacted with uh, colonists, whether they established small fishing villages, colonies, uh, temporary settlements, more permanent settlements. Uh, or whether, you know, ships just stop by along, you know, various coasts along North America. So the, so there's decades of this interaction. So uh, they could have been trying to benefit as well. And, you know, there's just some some curiosity as well. Um, and and they, they help them. The uh, pilgrims uh, also, you know, do their share of fishing and hunting and that kind of thing. So... Uh, but it's still, uh, despite this help and, and some, some amount of self-sufficiency, there, there's still a very difficult winter to endure uh, and to survive. 
I think that this is this is something that I found really interesting in the Mayflower book is that um, Philbrook really shows you how the Native American population in New England has has been in contact with Europeans before. It's not just the Pilgrims the first time that they've seen Europeans, and they, as you said, they have traded. And um, they've also experienced their own share of tragedy with, you know, the diseases that Europeans have brought over. And Philbrick talks about the site where they actually build the their settlement, the pilgrims built their settlement, was a Native American village that was absolutely decimated by smallpox. There was just no one left except, spoiler, who we know as Squanto, which, again, such a cool part of the story that he was actually taken away by previous Europeans, and that actually spared him from the smallpox epidemic. And he, of course, helps the pilgrims sort of establish them, their colony. But um, I think that's a, that's an interesting piece of the story that we don't always dwell on, is that there were various Native American groups. They were competing with each other, sometimes at war with each other, sometimes trading with each other. And the pilgrims are just sort of one player into this mix of many different people. So I think that's something that's um, a really interesting part of the story and also makes it much more like political kind of wheeling and dealing that we don't necessarily think about. We just think about, oh, they came and they survived this tough winter and then they, you know, had a meal to celebrate it. But it really was much more dire than that and much more like the lots of intrigue, I think, at the same time. So what actually happened at the first Thanksgiving is, I mean, today we think of, you know, this, how big is your turkey? And I know my dad is always bragging that he finds the biggest turkey he can possibly get. Needless to say, there, there was no turkey at the first Thanksgiving. But what, I mean, what was behind this, the idea of having this day of thanks? The pilgrims wanted to thank God, uh, you know, that that those who had survived did survive and to be thankful for the, the, the bountiful, uh, you know, nature that they found, you know, more in the spring and summer and to celebrate their first harvest as well, uh, of corn. Uh, and, you know, it really leads to, a, to a larger discussion of, you know, days of Thanksgiving. You know, I know we like to, to do it on the, the, the fourth, uh, Thursday of November every year and there's sort of a set pattern to all this but the pure the pilgrims puritans but even the american revolutionaries uh and into the 19th century even abraham lincoln during the the civil war would have occasional days of thanksgiving uh or they would also have days of fasting and prayer uh and it relates to the to the puritan covenant theology which was essentially the idea that the Puritans uh, were sort of a new Israel, if you will, uh, and God would would reward them, uh, would send them blessings if they held to their side of this covenant, which is a sacred agreement, uh, that they were to be faithful, that they were to be virtuous, that they were to follow God's laws and God's will for them. They would receive blessings, but also uh, if they strayed, if you know there was. Uh, sin uh, among them, a collective sin among them, uh, and they strayed from from their faithfulness, uh, both in in belief and and in deed, uh, that that God would punish them uh, with calamities like a smallpox epidemic or an earthquake or a bad harvest or a war or what have you, uh, and that they would hold days of of prayer and fasting, right? That's kind of the other side of this that we don't normally think of because we like <laughs> to just celebrate uh, you know, the bounty and eat a lot of food and, and be grateful. But uh, there's that other side of it. When bad things were happening, they felt that they were responsible for not living up to their end of the covenant uh, and would go to church all day long uh, and listen to sermons and pray and they wouldn't eat at all, right? They would fast. They would abstain from food uh, to force them to uh, think about their repentance. Uh, so this Puritan covenant theology is, is really, really important for understanding why they're having this, this Thanksgiving celebration at all. So the this idea of of giving thanks then, it wasn't, 
as you said, it wasn't confined to a specific day. It almost sounds like it was sort of called ad hoc when there was something to be thankful for. And I think what perhaps makes what we come to know as Thanksgiving more memorable or why we, we've latched onto it is this idea that Massasoit and his people come and join them for this. This is a beautiful moment if we're thinking about American history, because of course, relationships with Native American groups in American history are often very tragic and sad. But at this moment, in the very beginning, I think it's a a coming together of equals, really. I mean, they survive with each other's help. And um, they just spend that time together. And maybe they came to it for with different reasons. And we were like, Oh, you're having food, we'll sit down and have some food with you. Even though they're not, you know, buying into this idea of the of the covenant, they have their own worldviews and beliefs. But this is a sharing of of what they have, I think is is a really powerful thing and definitely worth commemorating every year. The first Thanksgiving is in 1621. So interestingly, it's going to be its 400th birthday (laughs) this year. Um, So maybe we should all have a birthday cake at our Thanksgiving table as well. But if we fast forward in time, right, Thanksgiving doesn't become a national holiday until the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln makes it a national holiday. And I think it's really interesting, Kirk, you were saying that it's not so much the actual event that we're celebrating. I think Phil Brooks says that the first Thanksgiving probably took place in September or October, not November. But um, but more the idea, I think that's really powerful too. Yeah, I think it's funny even calling it a first. I'm sure that Thanksgiving days were proclaimed back in England and, and throughout history as moments of reflection. And it's particularly interesting to think about it in the context of a tight-knit community or for, in our case, sort of a self-governing nation, because we are thankful – to one another, we're thankful for the for the blessings that we have, and I think it's it has been throughout American history an opportunity to stop uh, our busy lives and be grateful for everything that's around us. I think Abraham Lincoln's Thanksgiving Day proclamation during the Civil War was about successes and sort of the 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 course of the war. Uh, that's come up. Other presidents have done similar things, and certainly isn't unique to the United States or isn't unique to. Uh, you know, democratic government in any way. But I think it, it takes on a particular interesting context when you think about it that way, just to build on what you had said there, Mary, talking about coming together as a community. Um, and I think it represents a certain certain ideal towards which Americans look to. I think Thanksgiving is interesting because it, it's not necessarily a commemoration of that event, but that event is a model for Thanksgiving. And I think that that is that's different amongst holidays that we have because it's not a commemoration. It's supposed to be a moment where we reflect on what we are thankful for in a very personal way. Tony, you spoke about how religion was such a huge part of the pilgrims experience and their worldview. And I wonder is what value even for those Americans who are religious or who are not religious today, what value does Thanksgiving still have for us? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, as Amer- as Americans throughout American history have, have celebrated Thanksgiving and, and, and Lincoln makes it a, a national holiday and FDR kind of confirms when it's going to be held and so forth, Americans of all stripes continue to gather around, uh, typically with their families uh, and friends to celebrate Thanksgiving and to share a meal together and enjoy each other's company and and conversation. And there's something very beautiful and very powerful about that. It's, it's, and I think it's sort of become part of America's civil religion. And, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is that, you know, what unites us as Americans, uh, think about our, our founding, principles and ideals or aspirations as Americans, sort of what binds us together. And that has certain beliefs, but our civic religion also has certain practices and rituals, if you will, almost like a religion. And some of those, you know, we're very familiar with, you know, whether it's a 
you know, fireworks and a parade on the 4th of July to celebrate our national independence, uh, whether it's sort of a reflection on Memorial Day. Uh, and uh, certainly, I think Thanksgiving uh, is part of that, right? It, it's part of our, our national heritage uh, and, and our ideals. It gives us a, you know, hopefully a few minutes to, to kind of reflect uh, upon that spirit of a common purpose, focus upon that, that national unity. I think Thanksgiving uh, as a national holiday, uh, and as in many ways, a uniquely American holiday. Uh, can give us that that pause. That was really well said, Tony. And I think that Thanksgiving, you know, it gives us this time to to pause and reflect on what we're thankful for and to celebrate and create or uphold some of our own traditions at Thanksgiving. So what what do your families do? That's a special part of Thanksgiving for you. Well, I know that we're having uh, some some family members over, but we're also having our next door neighbors over who uh, didn't didn't have uh, anywhere to go. Uh, and although we have the standard turkey and corn and mashed potatoes and such, uh-huh. uh, I know that uh, because I'm Italian American, uh, continuing uh, tradition from my childhood of having ravioli uh, <laughs> as part of our feast and. You know, why not? Right. That's so distinctly American uh, as part of this melting pot to, uh, you know, celebrate the the typical American traditions, but also, you know, add a a little ethnic uh, flavor to it as well. Mine's a little similar. We're all getting together at my family home in Indiana, which should be a lot of fun uh, with lots of family. And there's always two traditions that I've been told are Irish, uh, as my family is Irish. Um, but I, I've never actually gone back and confirmed. So maybe this is a good opportunity for me to ask some questions, Mary, and, and confirm. But we always do uh, cheddar cheese with apple pie. So like super sharp cheddar cheese to go along with the apple pie. Um, and then uh, my grandmother insists that we continue, and this is possibly more English, but creamed herring, uh, which I do not find appetizing. But we have it Ooh. at every <laughs> uh, major holiday, Thanksgiving in particular. So those are those are a couple of things. Uh, but it's a great opportunity, you know, always to, to get together. And it seems like we always end up sharing family stories, too, where our families come from. And, and I'm sure that there's a few other Midwestern traditions we've thrown in there. But they're, they're so a part of my life, I can't even pick them apart anymore. So... <laughs> Well, my family, we always start, we break bread together and we have to go around and say what we're thankful for. So you always want to be the last, if the last person always gets stuck with this enormous hunk of bread, because everyone takes off this tiny little piece. But um, my mom insists on it. And as she says, we will remember it when I'm gone, you'll remember it. So um, we will definitely be doing that. And I am I am thankful to work at the Bill of Rights Institute. I'm thankful for wonderful colleagues like you, Kirk and Tony and Haley, our producer, who's not talking, but she's here with us too. And I'm thankful for you, for our listeners. And I would love to hear your thoughts, your traditions for Thanksgiving, or any thoughts or comments that you have on this episode or ideas for future episodes, you can write to us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. Until then, have a happy, healthy Thanksgiving and keep asking questions. Take care. The Bill of Rights Institute engages, educates, and empowers individuals with a passion for the freedom and opportunity that exist in a free society. Check out our educational resources and programs on our website, mybri.org. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes? We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to stay connected and informed about future episodes. Thank you for listening.